We've got an interesting sort of gig lined up today. Uh, if you recall, last Christmas I played with a group called the Lilac Brass Quintet. You can hear them by going to the video up in the card if you still care to listen to Christmas music at this time of the year, which I certainly don't blame you if you don't. Uh, but I was playing high brass with them. Today, uh, we've got another brewery gig where we're doing three hour-long sets, and I will be playing the French horn. I don't think I've ever had to play it for that long in one go, so... We will see how that goes, for sure. I've also got my curly alto horn with me in case we need to go into some of our reserve music, if you will, because the horn parts in that stuff are written for E-flat horn and not F horn. I didn't really feel like doing the transposition on the fly. Oh boy. Yeah, the venue is rather well attended today. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have quite a time finding parking here. <sighs> And so we concluded set one of three. I was feeling mostly fine, muscularly speaking, but I was having a lot of trouble hearing myself. The space was no concert hall, that's not necessarily to be expected, but I definitely wasn't hearing myself as well as I'd hoped to be able to, and I found myself missing an awful lot of notes. I found myself regularly just switching to the B-flat side to just get my bearings again, because the notes are a little bit further apart and more stable when you've got the trigger down versus just playing on the straight F side. And I found myself doing that a lot more than I would have liked to, on notes that generally I would never touch the B-flat trigger for. But we finished the set, you know, whatever, I felt mostly fine. I told Alex, the second trumpet, about this. I'm, I'm like, Alex, I can't really even hear myself here. It's, it's really rough. I feel like I'm blowing my brains out. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, don't do that. Don't blow your brains out. And in the coming two sets, I kind of realized what he meant. One of the absolute biggest problems for me on this gig was the water. There was such an accumulation of condensation inside my instrument at all times during this gig. After every tune, I would take some time to just do a little dance. You know, I'd, I'd be, I'd take the mouthpiece out, 
I'd try and get it out this end. I'd take the dump slide off. And when that inevitably wouldn't work, I would then put that back in and rotate it around clockwise from my perspective to get it out the bell. <laughs> Just after every tune, it was ridiculous. There was always something in there. I think it's worse when it's cold out. And so I was just getting so much condensation piling up all the time. So after each set, I would entirely disassemble all the slides on the instrument and dump every single one out and just blow vigorously through the horn after I reattached just the main tuning slides. And still, it just was doing me no good. And so with half an hour's break, we started set two of three. I would say set two is where both I and probably the ensemble as a whole did our best work and it's certainly where I had the most fun, because at that point we were well enough acquainted with the space to listen to each other a little bit better than, let's say, the first set, but we weren't as fatigued as we were in, let's say, the third set. I also did get to play some curly alto this set instead of kind of sitting out for the quartet stuff, but it was an adjustment because we had a door open to my backside or to the side of the quintet, and so as to let people in, right? But what it was also conveniently letting in was the winter draft. We started to get some really nice little wind chills coming in around the end of the second set. So by the time I pick up my alto, it is ice cold. Normally I have the tuning slide out a ways. Not so today as you might expect. I was struggling to find the centers on any of the notes, and to be honest, even though the mouthpiece shouldn't be that much of an adjustment, it really was. You know, playing on a fatter rim and slightly wider inner diameter after having the horn mouthpiece imprinted into my face for a grand total of almost two hours at that point, it was, uh, it was definitely something. Somehow the well really ran dry this set, we got through our pieces even quicker than the last one, and so we had to dip into the quintet book that we were using around Christmas time, which like I said I was on trumpet and flugelhorn and such things for, and we turned to Jesu Bambino, one of my absolute favorite Christmas pieces, really really beautiful, but the thing is, in that setup we'd had Alex on his E flat horn for the French horn part, and Dave was on second trumpet, and so we're doing some parts swapping so that we're not sight reading new parts, and as I'm having first trumpet or flugelhorn handed to me, I'm kind of thinking to myself, how am I going to do this? Am I going to do it on French horn? Am I going to do it on the alto horn? Like, how is this going to work? And then Alex hands me his trumpet and says, good luck. <sighs>
Needless to say, I was pretty thankful to be done with this set. The folks at the brewery brought out some food for us. They were very nice the whole time, by the way. They were very accommodating. And at this point, they brought out some food. I forgot to get any before shots of this, but believe me, we decimated it, as you'll see here. And it made us feel a lot physically better heading into set number three, even though we were fatigued in the chop area. <laughs> Set three was even more of a roller coaster than the other two. It was a lot to take in. At this point, I was obviously best sonically accustomed to the space and the sound of the notes that were supposed to be coming out my bell, but I was definitely fatigued. Um, I don't think I had it worse out of the quintet because horn's not the most chopping instrument that would probably go to trumpet. I mean, it's just so chop heavy. And so we, we were definitely having quite a time. That is for sure. <laughs>
Thankfully, I did not have to play any trumpet this set, but I did do a little bit more curly alto playing. Um, and I, I got to play Jesu Bambino again. And I said, no trumpet this time, please. And I tried to do it on the curly alto. For a while, it actually, I would say, worked fairly well. And then I, my body seemed to remember how tired I was. <laughs> but we held it together, the five of us, as best as we could to the bitter end. This was one of my very first gigs on the French horn, and definitely an intensely educational one. First things first, I tend to forget that I play one of the darkest horns known to mankind. In fact, the Con 8D is so dark that it's being phased out of American orchestras in favor of brighter sounding gyre wraps with smaller bells that project a little bit better. And I was definitely feeling the effects of that on this gig. And I also learned I was not doing myself any favors whatsoever with this big toilet bowl Dennis Wick 4N. It's the widest inner diameter horn mouthpiece I own, and it's close to the deepest. It's quite deep and has a fairly wide throat. The cup just feels like it goes straight down. And that is the trouble. I always used to think, oh, you know, bigger cup, bigger sound. Uh, it's not quite like that. And I think the flugelhorn is a good manifestation of that, where you obviously have a very deep V-shaped cup, especially if you play a Dennis Wick flugel piece like me. But I realized at Christmas that that deep cup was actually making it a little bit harder for me to project outwards. And this is just the exact same ball game. I obviously did not learn my lesson the first time. So while this is an amazing mouthpiece in terms of feel on the face, and it's great for recording with, and for softer, more sensitive playing, I would choose nothing else. Maybe not for a three-hour brass quintet gig. You know, I frustrate myself with my own decisions sometimes, but that was not the only thing I learned. I also learned just how important it is to keep your hand right up against the inside of the bell and a little bit further in than you might think, and that's kind of what'll turn out best for intonation, because if your hand starts to come out a little bit, as it tended to do at the end of my sets, you start losing the focus on your notes. They start to not only get out of tune, but not as well slotted as before. And the inclination, if your hand comes out and you're having more trouble supporting the instrument, is to maybe clamp up with the hand a little bit. And that is how you ruin your own projection, because obviously you're stuffing up your horn now. You're kind of on your way to half-stopping, which is not exactly what you want to do when you're trying to project more. And that's how you end up blowing your brains out, as I said. I also wish I'd played a little bit more from the bottom this gig. I definitely found myself playing with my face, if you will, the first set, which is kind of finagling with my chops to find the note instead of just trusting that if I take a full breath and compress the abdominals a little bit, the air will support itself well enough to basically find the notes. It's like, come on, Sam, you know what the notes sound like, you just gotta trust that they're gonna happen. But I couldn't really build that trust with myself on the first set, and I ended up fatiguing myself down the road a little bit more than I ought to have. If I had been taking those nice full breaths and compressing them from the abdominals properly from the get-go, I think I would have been a little bit less fatigued overall. In any case, it gave me a few things to work on to have experienced this gig, and I'm glad I did because now I can focus my practice a little bit more. Overall, the experience really was one to cherish. Our hosts were great. I mean, they brought us out a giant pretzel after the second set, so I can hardly say anything bad about them, right? That was a really good pretzel, by the way. That hit hard after the second set. Although the venue was not sonically perfect, of course, it was very, very well attended. It was a big event. There were a lot of people there at all times, even though it wasn't always the same people. People were coming and leaving as they pleased. And it was really cool to see people enjoying our music. That's a huge part of the fun of a gig is the fact that your music doesn't just exist in a vacuum, but that other people around you are soaking it in and enjoying it. And I think, again, the second set was kind of the magic one for us where people were enjoying it most. I guess that's sort of the, the effects of alcohol, maybe. <laughs> the first set, people weren't as willing to get up and dance and hoot and holler, whereas the second set, they were starting to get into their groove a little bit. In any case, I'd like to hopefully chalk it up, not entirely to alcohol, but partially just the fun-loving spirit in the air. And of course, it was a great experience getting to play with the Lilac Brass again. I do see them all in brass band, but it's cool to get to do the little small ensemble thing as well. I'm very thankful for this experience. Like I said, I had fun and learned plenty from it, and I hope you've enjoyed following along with me as I attempted to chronicle it in some sense. If you want to check out more gig vlogs like this, you can check out the playlist in the top right corner in the card. Make sure to leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed, and please check to make sure that you are actually subscribed to the Samuel Plays Brass channel, unlike most of my viewers. It's a small gesture with a huge impact on the channel, and we'll keep more content like this coming out. 
In any case, thank you so much for now for watching, and until next time, we'll see you on the flip side.